Hello, hello, and welcome back to a new episode of the Flying Cat Marketing Interview Series. Today is a very special episode because my guest is Flying Cat Marketing's head editor, Robert Beams. How's it going, Rob? It's going great, man. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy to be on the show. It's long overdue. We've been talking about this since I joined, so very excited to be here as a, as a regular listener of the podcast. <laughs> I know this is really cool. You're actually the first, uh, other than myself, the first team member of Flying Cat Marketing to be on the podcast. Like you said, I always wanted to get you on it because we're always chatting about content quality, hiring writers, and we've had such a big growth sprint basically ever since you got hired a little under a year ago. So I think that there's a lot that we can talk about today. But before we dive in, for those who don't know you yet, uh, why don't you give us a little bit about your background and how you started, how you joined the team? Yeah, kind of from a strange route, really. I, I my sort of career, if you can call it that, is that I I studied I studied film at university, uh, and then um, I was a film journalist for a while, which I think is one of the things that caught your eyes. That I'd done an amount of sort of journalism, uh, which we'll get on to talk more about that as we talk about finding writers, uh, and then to for various reasons, my wife and I moved to Barcelona, which is where we live now, where a lot of the Flying Cat team's based. Um, and because there wasn't really a market for an English film journalist in Barcelona, I was sort of looking around for other jobs. I, I fell into sales for a while. I was doing sales for, I think, maybe five years. Um, and then I just really wanted to change. I wanted to get back into stuff to do with the written word, with language, with journalism tangentially. Um, and looking into avenues like that. Um, and when I saw the advert for Flying Cat and saw your values and saw all the things about the company that are so exciting, um, I took a chance and applied. And I was just really uh, surprised and grateful to kind of be given the opportunity, really, because on paper, and I will talk about this, I suppose, when we talk into how we find writers and things like that. But on paper, I'm not necessarily the traditional fit to kind of come in and do this. And um I guess you were looking at other things in terms of sort of skills and that kind of aspect, but it's, it's been a phenomenal opportunity and I've, I've absolutely loved it. Like you said, I've been here for nearly a year and uh, it's, it's such a nice sort of close knit core team. It's one of the things we recently, I was actually hiring writers as we're sort of going on to talk about. And one of the things I was asked um, was about how you can have a close knit core team. Like how can you guys be a kind of um a unit and have a bond and have like that sort of camaraderie when you're all kind of based around and you work remotely. Um, and, and, uh, it's never really been an issue here because we have such a strong culture and everyone is so, this sounds kind of really kind of a weak way of putting it, but everyone is so nice, you know, everyone is so friendly, <laughs> that it's, uh, it's always been a real pleasure. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been really lucky to join this team and to find myself in this team and, um, yeah, I'm really excited to sort of talk about some of the experiences we've had so far in this year where, um, like you were saying, it's it's kind of been crazy, the growth, right? Like we we started off, I think when I joined the team, I was the, what, fourth core yeah, member of the team? Yeah, I think so. And Katie and Pilar had joined like a couple of weeks before you. Okay, so I'd have been, <laughs> I'd have been the fifth. I'd been like the fifth member of the core team. And then um, it's just snowballed and we're bringing in lots more people, loads more clients, you know, so it's. Yeah, it's been crazy, but it's been exciting. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you in the team, and we're lucky to have you, Rob. And like you mentioned, uh, hiring writers has been one of the main things. You know, you got hired, and we were like, we just need somebody to edit these blog posts. And it turned out to be so much more than that because we need more and more writers. And then it's kind of this balance between how do we find writers who get the product, who can write well, who work within our systems, who like working with us. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've been doing a lot more hiring writers lately than I have. So what has been the biggest challenge for you in hiring a team of writers? I think there are a lot of challenges when it comes to hiring writers. I, I'm going to go, even though I've only got the experience in English, I'm going to go ahead and make the claim that it's even harder in English, just because I think that English is so widely spoken as well, um, that even if this is something I found we're advertising for the in-house positions recently that we've recently filled, um, 
But even if you put native level of English, that doesn't, that doesn't exclude anybody applying. You still have hundreds of applications of people who aren't at the desired level of English, which makes it harder to kind of filter out as well. Um, I think the other thing which people in all kinds of writing jobs, like my, my wife's a copywriter and she has this issue a lot where writing is one of those jobs where everyone's got an opinion because everyone can write, right? Everyone thinks they are a writer. Yeah. So um, I think for that reason as well, because everyone thinks they're a writer because everybody can literally write. It's also, I think you've mentioned before, freelance writing is a job where lots of people do it because they want a certain lifestyle. They want to be a digital nomad. They want to travel. They want to be a freelance, um, self-employed. Um, and, and it's kind of a way into that. So I think that the thing is, is when you throw, when you throw out an advert, when you kind of cast a net and you say, I want an English writer, you're casting it to just so many people. And you've really got to be very careful kind of how you whittle that down. And that can be time consuming. So I think that's one of the big challenges. One of the ways we've experimented with addressing that is in a hopefully unobtrusive, non-irritating way. We've, <laughs> we've added more barriers to entry, if you like, where, for example, we request a loom video for the writer to sort of tell us a bit about themselves and, and things like that beyond just a CV or samples and things like that. And that, that does um that does filter it somewhat and it makes it easier to sort of um tell from 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 early on in the process um but it's also really tricky because one of our core things is that which hopefully all of the listeners know if they've been following you for a while or following your your social media presence is that we're not a typical seo agency and we don't believe in uh kind of boring bog standard seo content and the, the problem is, the problem I guess we're addressing in the market is that most SEO content is that. And so when you're asking for writers and they're giving you their samples, um, most of the samples are written in a boring SEO formula way. And that's not even necessarily the fault of those writers to some extent. Like I think a lot of them are, they are writing SEO as they know it, as they've been told about it. Yeah. Um, so the thing is as well, when you're looking for somebody to write for us, which is, I would say, slightly unique. But all you've got to go on is what people have done in the past, but they're not writing for us. So that also makes testing them risky. And you're sort of having to look at their samples that are in that very traditional SEO format um, with an eye on kind of trying to spot things to, to see, what, but can they break away from this? And some, sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes um, I mentioned earlier that I know you like a journalistic background and things like that, which is something that we're quite into having in our writers. Um, so sometimes people will have samples that, uh, are not from a traditional SEO background where they're showing that they're a storyteller, maybe they've written for a magazine or something along those lines. And that's, that always kind of, um, you know, if you're any writers listening, who want to send us a, uh, you know, their portfolio, those things always stand out, right? Because they're not the typical formula. Um, but it, but I think those are some of the challenges, basically a, a lot of people who, who kind of come for, to write English SEO, they, they used to writing it in a particular type of way. Um, and writing being a sort of a desirable job with almost no barrier to entry at, at the lowest level. Yeah, um, I found that a lot. If you read any kind of blog post about how to become a remote worker, how to become a digital nomad, ways to make money at home, uh, you're going to find at the top of every single one of those lists, start writing. Businesses will pay you to write stuff for them. And then everybody goes and applies for it. And it does not mean that they're passionate writers. So you mentioned that we've added some barriers to entry. Uh, we've experimented a lot with this we have. form. At first, it was just, I don't even remember if we had samples at the beginning. It was just like, apply to work for us. And then we were like, whoa, <laughs> most of this is so bad. Um, of course, we've had some gems. Um so what what have we I, I would I would love to to dive into the ways that we've changed the the testing format, the hiring, and how it's gotten us better writers. Mm. Okay. So one of the things we did, because early on, I think when I started, we were requesting samples. That was that was in there then. <laughs> uh, but, um one of the first things that I added to try and add a slight more of a barrier was for people to, because quite rightly, and I think we agree with this as well, most writers don't want to write a paid, an unpaid, sorry, 
test piece. They don't want yeah. to spend that time on an unpaid piece. Though a lot of writers will tell you, fair, completely fair enough, upfront, they're not going to do that or even entertain that. Um, but on, on another level, we do need to see an example of something they've actually written off the cuff um, for us bespoke. So one of the things we introduced, along with introducing this idea of a little loom video where they can talk about themselves, um, is a short intro. So we give them, uh, we always ask sort of what their verticals of expertise are um, in, as part of the form. And then we've been asking them to write a short intro, how they would, um, how they would introduce an article. I think it's about uh, a SaaS tool in the area of their vertical. And from that short intro and the Loom video, you get a really good sense of sort of how this person fits. And then you can kind of decide to kind of look at the samples and go to more yeah. detail. But basically from that intro, you can tell the people who really just write a very generic intro. And also I think the thing is as well with samples, um, and I know we've, I've seen content on LinkedIn from very experienced people who've, who've had this view. Um, you don't know how truthful those samples are either. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting there's a lot of nefarious freelance writers out there. I think most of it's kind of in good faith, but I think that you've got to accept that those samples have possibly also been heavily edited, um, possibly by the company, you know, that they've written for. Um, so you don't exactly know, um, even in some cases, maybe they're not even that person's work, although mm -hmm. I think that's probably very, very rare. Um, and so what this intro thing does as well is it just says, well, can you string words together in a nice way for us here, please just now? Uh, and, uh, I think that's a really, I think that's been really helpful. And I think we did see, um, uh, a, a definitely an improvement, certainly probably, probably from my side, rather than from the side of the writers, because I have more to go on when deciding who I want to bring in and test on a piece. So um, rather than just going off the back of these samples, you can kind of be more selective and, and see these loom videos and see these intros. And I think that paints the picture a lot better. Definitely. It shows how much effort somebody is, even just the loom videos. I remember once I was just browsing through the applications and in the section where it says link to your loom video, just record one minute or whatever saying why you want to work with us. It's somebody just wrote not applicable. For <laughs> NA, yeah, no, I was like, gonna, yeah, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say that does that does also filter people out on that end of the process because recently, not just with the freelance writers, but as I was saying, we've run a process recently where we've been hiring for some in-house writing and editing talent, and the number of people that on a form will just write no or something. You'll say like, <laughs> can you just write a little intro or something? Just go no, or uh, <laughs> it, is, it does sort of help you make a decision. Great. Yeah, because those people, they would have put their samples in, uh, you know, and we would have read through them and spent that time and then write a paragraph. They say, no, why even why even submit the application, really? Yeah, exactly. So I think I think there are a lot of, sort of challenges and we've it's still not a perfect system. Like I think I think most people out there who are involved in this, I have experienced in this would agree that there isn't like a kind of a perfect silver bullet way to do this, I think. I think one of the things um, that's kind of another challenge I didn't mention, but that you alluded to earlier on is that also, um, obviously we, like any other agency, we have a budget and the, it sometimes can come down to, do we prioritize someone who's got heavy subject matter expertise or do you have amazing writing ability? Yeah. Um, and ideally you want both, but people who are both and in budget are, are kind of can be a bit of a unicorn. And I think what we worked out months ago now, we've changed a lot of our processes, was about trying to find the people who have the good writing ability or the written ability, um, where, where possible, obviously the expertise as well, but prioritizing written ability. Um, and we're doing a lot more work up front now to help our writers in terms of getting subject matter expertise into the pieces. Because I mean, another one of our USPs as an agency and the kind of values we bring is about trying to make sure SEO content is true thought leadership and is actually offering something new and it isn't just regurgitating the top five pieces yeah. on Google. And I think that we've added a lot of processes in conjunction with improving the processes for finding the writers. We've also improved the processes internally for making sure those writers are armed with the information they need to bring real insights into the pieces as well. Let's talk about that because this has been so much work with all of the team to get this new subject matter expertise into the process. 
Uh, and we haven't shared very much about it publicly yet. We've also, obviously we've talked about it with our clients. I maybe have posted about it once, but let's dig deep. And we haven't perfected the process yet. <laughs> it's still it's still underway. We're still finding the right way to do it. And it might end up being a kind of case by case thing, depending on the client and the, the content strategy that we're doing. But I think that it's useful to learn about, even if people aren't working with an agency. But for example, if you have a big company and you got a content marketer, how do you pass on the subject matter expertise to them mm -hmm. so that they're writing with the same knowledge level as one of the executives, for example. So walk us through the the, the draft of our subject matter expertise or, or what we have going on now. And, and how do you pass that on to different writers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it's a complicated one. I'll start by saying that like to flesh out sort of again, why we need it, which you've just spoke a little bit about is like, we do expect our writers to do research. We expect them to go and often find things in the pieces. Lots of our writers will submit Harrow requests, which is like help a reporter out, or they might go on Reddit or Quora or explore forums and Facebook groups and all those kind of things. We encourage our writers to do those things. So this isn't, this isn't a pass for writers not to do research, but it's an acceptance of the fact that a freelance writer who needs to write from the, from the real kind of thought leadership authority position of maybe a CEO for a company that's, that's kind of hired us, they, they, they really need to have genuine insights and it's not necessarily realistic to expect them to knock those out of the park completely on their own. So what we've done in addition to the research that we expect them to do is um, it's, it's a process that involves first off um, at the stage, where, and I don't know how deep you want to get in sort of how the sausage gets made, but like at the stage where the briefs are being created by the strategy team now, we will go into each one on a uh, kind of a semi-regular basis, a quarterly basis, or even a six-month period. We'll go over the bulk of uh, basically topics that we have uh, that we're going to be covering um, from a strategy point of view, and then we'll get the insights from the customer themselves and the client themselves to actually say, well, what are the key things? Let's say we're doing a tool comparison piece. Well, which really are the, the real USPs you want to hammer home? Which are the tools we really want to talk about? You know, which, what's the angle here you really want to have? Yeah. Um, but beyond that, we'll also, because obviously we're not asking our customers to write the pieces for us, but that's just one of the things we tried to make sure from the start, we have that expertise. We're also speaking as part of our process on boarding our customers, we speak to their customers which feeds into it. These things all get put into uh, a unified document, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second, but we'll pull, we'll pull what the client says into it. We'll pull what their customers say into it. Uh, we'll find out what their customer's voice is from that as well and try and write in the voice of their customer. Um, and we'll also on a piece by piece basis, go out and find subject matter experts as well in the wild as well. We'll put those requests up there ourselves. We'll go and interview people. I know you did a lot of interviews for one of our customers to absolutely make sure we nailed uh, a piece we did for them. And you spoke to lots of um, senior people in that industry, basically. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing we get that uh, feel, informs our pieces. And then in terms of how much relate to lots of different writers, we, we used to have, when I started, a um, basically like a PowerPoint presentation made in Canva, right? That was like uh, uh, the, the, the overall tone of voice document, which is something that by its nature as being very nicely presented in Canva was something that was very hard to actually update and edit. And also something being in a PowerPoint presentation kind of format, you also are limited for space because it's a really a, loads of text makes for a very ugly slide as well. So it ended up being kind of quite high level and it wasn't very easy to update. So what we're doing now, what I'm in the middle of trying to do and roll out across all of our clients, we're kind of getting there, is replacing those with what we've called internally these living tone of voice documents, living TOV documents. That's a slight misnomer because they're more than a tone of voice document. They're also the ideal customer profile. We're also bringing in that customer voice information. Um, and also any feedback or subject matter expertise we pick up along the way that gets fed into that document. So the all of our writers, like if a brand new writer comes in tomorrow on a project, they can read that document and refer to that document. And they should, in theory, be as up to speed on that project as other people who've been writing on it much longer. Uh, obviously, there's still a learning process and giving people a lot of information up front. Like people obviously naturally don't immediately get everything, but it's something we found is working very well, actually, to um, 
capture a lot of those uh, things we learn along the way on a project, pass them to writers. We can also use that to pull in examples. So for example, we had a, um, we've got a client who really wanted a very specific tone of voice. They had specific ideas about using GIFs and things like that. So we've managed to, in the tone of voice document, we can put in, okay, these are examples of how they want to use a GIF. Here are examples of what their tone of voice sounds like. Here's a piece from their website, or here's a piece from a website of a, of a client, of a, another company that they aspire to sound mm -hmm. like. So we can pull all of that information in to inform the writer as well. Yeah, that has made a huge difference. I think these living tone of voice documents, something that you can keep updating. Because it's true, when we had those Canva PowerPoint presentations, when we got feedback from the client, there was nowhere really to put it except for our own brains. Like, oh, remember that the client likes it this way. Mm -hmm. So now we can actually put it into those documents, refer to it, and make sure that it keeps getting better and better. And also when the new writer comes on, you don't have to keep reminding them, oh, by the way, the client likes it when you say things like this. Exactly. Because it's all there. And it's, it's really good for, as well for specific small things because Obviously with big things, if it's a major issue, then even with our old process, we could have probably found a way to update all the writers on that or, or something. But when it's the really small things, like they don't like this word, they oh, please avoid saying this product is, I don't know, toxin free. We say it's without bleach or whatever it is, right? Uh, it's, it's much easier to feed that very specifically into this document very easily and just to build that into the overall thing we have about words to, words to use, words to avoid, phrases yeah. to use, phrases to avoid in a way that's really hard to update in a piecemeal way because they're these tiny things and they'll just get lost if there's no single source of the truth on it. Yeah, so how many, how many writers are on the... I feel like I should know the answer to this, but... <laughs> How many writers are on the team now? It's like 10. We, in terms of freelance writers, yeah, we have, we have around 10 to 15, I'd say. So what is it like to manage all of them? Tell us about your writer knowledge base and the process you have for, for keeping them uh, motivated and enjoying continuing to write for us. I think, I think the two things that are really good for what we do, because recently we did a feedback survey for our writers and we tried to get their input on how they like our communication, how they like our workflows and how they feel about writing for us. And we were very lucky that um, all of our writers came back. Well, it's not really luck, but you know what I mean? We were very <laughs> grateful that all of our writers came back and said pretty much unanimously, I would refer you to a friend. I do really like working with you. And not for me personally, but you know, for the company. And, um, I think part of that is, um, and this is something that was in the company before I got here. This is something that you've instituted, but we're a company that really likes using loom videos, as I've mentioned already. So we will, um, if we've got a lot of feedback to give rather than just dumping it all in, um, track change, you know, suggestions in the, in the document and leaving it there. Um, I mean, one of our values is actually that we over communicate, right? We do that internally. We do that with our clients. We do that with our, you know, with our writers. Um, and so we don't just dump the suggested changes in, in the Google document. We will also, um, I'll record as long a loom as is needed. I've recorded one just before this for one of our writers, which was, you know, an eight minute long video, but it was just going through, um, piece by piece, sort of reassuring them about, Hey, this is really great. But also I think this needs this, this, and this done. And we can pull this from here and take a look at this and kind of, I think that is one of the reasons that our writers appreciate us and, and that we kind of, um, one of the ways we manage that relationship as well, because, uh, obviously receiving, and I mean, you worked as a freelance writer in the past, like receiving a job, lot of feedback just from somebody when you think maybe you've done a good job and it comes back with like loads of red lines and it's like, you know, it just seems like everything's done a hell on it. That, that could be really daunting. And I think one of the approaches of doing it with Loom is we always put a human face on feedback. We always explain yeah. what we want. We always try and explain it in a nice way and remember that we're dealing with a human being so that's um that's one thing another thing is that in the workflow tool that we use which is ClickUp, um i also do a kind of a monthly i guess roundup info dump where i'll collect together bits that maybe we've realized need improving in processes maybe it's something all the writers are doing that's not a best practice or it's something that needs to be improved or you know maybe they're not requesting images in a very useful way because we've got a graphic designer you know sometimes we do bespoke images and i think one of the ones recently was there was some confusion about how that was done so i use this regular once a month kind of 
memo to all the writers to address those concerns. And I think that's really important as well, because I think if we're constantly telling them as these things arise, um, we've got to, we've got to be realistic about the fact that for a lot of them, we are not their only client. We are one of many clients. And if we're constantly, they're getting notifications from us in ClickUp saying, oh, read this, read this. And then they start seeing that maybe two out of three of those things don't directly relate to them. They're very quickly going to tune out of even reading what we tell them. So I think they appreciate as well that um, it's a once a month thing that they're given all that information in one job lot. And then they kind of, you know, give us a thumbs up and click up to say they've read it. And I think that's been a very useful and reliable way to make sure the writers all kind of are kept up to date as well, because, because they're not in-house kind of team members. They're not in our meetings, you know, they're not in all yeah. of these other calls. They're not living with Flying Cat day to day. So I think things like recording them the looms of the human face and giving them these regular but not too regular updates are ways that the kind of we have a feeling of a team of writers that work with us quite closely. Yeah, it's been it's been an adventure. I think that all of this, the ways that we're working with the writers and the, I'm very excited to get this in-house team of writers as well. I love working with freelancers. I have a lot of respect for freelancers, um, but I'm also excited to have this editorial team be a part of what of what we're doing so um i wanted to ask you just about the relationship between editors and and writers and why do i mean i know why i believe in it but um you know what's the benefit of writers always having an editor in in this it makes sense obviously if you're trying to publish uh a book or you know things where it's it's quite common to have an editor they say of course you need an editor on this but we're in a very fast-paced environment mm. we're publishing seo content uh it's really about abp always be publishing uh i think that an editor is vital necessary that it doesn't matter how good the writer is you need an editor what's your take yeah i mean i would say that even our very very best writers um, it's uncommon to go through an entire draft and not find anything that could be improved. You know, that's really uncommon. It's happened like twice, you know, since I've been here, you know, it's rare. Um, I think that even the best writers, like even, you know, like uh, not kissing ass, but you're a very good writer and you've written very good content. And even if I look at something you've written, I'll see mistakes. Oh, you know, I always so like, need yeah. editing. The other day I published, <laughs> I published a case study. I published a case study like two days ago. I got at least three messages from people on LinkedIn being like, hey, did you notice this mistake? (laughs) I didn't even review it myself. Uh, And I was like, oh, man, I really got to give my stuff to Rob before I publish it. (laughs) Um, But it's like, I think like to 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 um, go back to the example of my wife working with copywriting again, like she writes short form marketing copy and that will go around loads of rounds of approvals and it will get seen by a lot more people than look over our content and they'll still find mistakes later in the process. People will still go, yeah. I don't like this. So the thing is, is that um, it is it is a vital thing to be doing and to have those rounds of review. And I, I think as well that there's been occasions where either because I've had to rewrite something or when I started, I was doing some of the writing internally as well on a few projects. Um, like I would make those mistakes as well. When I've had to do a lot of rewriting on a piece, I'll often say to you, like, either can you just read the, not even if I've rewritten it, if I've done a lot of heavy editing on a piece, I'll go to you sometimes and I'll say, can you look at this? Because I've been looking at this document for two hours and right now I'm kind of lost and I can't see the forest of the trees now. So I think if you're a writer and you're the best writer in the world, uh, but you've spent however many hours in that document, you are kind of, you're no longer really able to view it objectively. I think even your brain will trick you into thinking things that are spelt wrong or phrased poorly are fine because mm-hmm. you've like read them so many times, you know, kind of what they're supposed to say. Like every time I see the word calendar, I'm like, is that how you spell it? Sure. <laughs> um, I had once seen um, a keynote talk. I think I've told you about this before by the, the lead copy editor at The New Yorker. I can't remember her name. It's so embarrassing. Mary something. Um, And she was saying that it doesn't matter if it's Hunter Thompson or whoever submitting a submitting a manuscript to them. It goes through nine different editing grounds. Nine. And then we're here trying to expect that one that one writer is going to be able to 
you know, there are so many agencies that are like this one writer. We're not going to give them any subject matter expertise. We're not going to the only research they're going to have to do is summarizing the top 10 Google articles and rewriting that. And we're not going to give them an editor. And yet we're supposed to come up with a thought leadership piece because of that. Oh, Rob, you've frozen. Yeah, so it's good to have a lot of editing, Ralph. <laughs> In summary. Yeah. Okay. So for technical hitch on this side. Um yeah, no, absolutely. I've I also think that um you have some writers as well are kind of they might be really good writers, but writers can be very blind to their own affectations. So I think we know one or two writers we've got who've got certain things they'll fall into doing. And they'll get out of them and it's fine. You know, you say like, oh, you're doing this again and then I'll stop it. But it's like, there are writers as well that have particular, maybe phrases they continually go back to or things they keep going, you know, the, when they're writing the piece, they're kind of second nature and they haven't even noticed. Yeah. So that's one of the things we catch as well. I think as well, another one of our values is this kind of zero fluff approach. And um, I think as well that like, there are many things that couldn't be edited down a little bit for. Uh, um, to improve clarity or just to sort of get to the point faster as well. Like, you know, you, you see a lot of 700 to a thousand, you know, maybe a thousand is pushing it, but very long intros in, in SEO as well. Yeah. So I think we've kind of editing is good for that stuff as well. Definitely. I mean, it doesn't matter how good the writer is at the end of the day, just having a second pair of eyes on it to bounce ideas around with, or just to say like, I've looked at this sentence so many times, I can't figure out another way to say it. And that happens to anybody. Mm. So having that as a part of the team is vital, I think. And it's such a such a valuable position in the in the editorial team. I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have my job. <laughs> so Rob, what do you think uh is a is a major takeaway for a listener here? Yeah, I think I think one of them is if you're hiring writers and you're really struggling, don't worry. Uh, it, it Everybody, to all of us, everyone is. Yeah, I think that anything you can do to get more information from the people who want to write for you earlier uh, is probably going to be a massive benefit. Whether that's doing what we're doing and having them record you a short video, I think, like you said, Maiva, that really does root out as well people who aren't really their heart's not in it. One of the things we ask our writers as well that I didn't mention is like, why do you want to write for Flying Cat? And that gets a lot of interesting response because you get people, I've had people write not applicable in that field. A bit <laughs> so it's They're like, like, I don't want to. Yeah. But when you get people who are like, oh, I follow your CEO and I really like your content and I like your values. And I think I also have this value, whatever that makes you kind of go, okay, well, they actually have, if, even if they've just done some research to talk to us or whatever, but. But it's like, it just shows they put the effort in as well and that they are somewhat invested in working with us. Yeah. So I think that's one of the main things is, is to put those uh, those things in place um, for sure. And not to get disheartened when uh, when it's hard. Definitely. keep Just keep going. Just keep going. <laughs> Amazing. Well, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you, Rob. And I hope everybody enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, Please give it a like, subscribe, share with a friend or colleague and uh, pop on over to LinkedIn and say hi to Rob. Yes, over there. Indeed. Unless you want. Is there anywhere else you would like for people to connect with you on? No, I mean, I'm I am on I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Robert Beams, Flying Cat Marketing. Uh, I do also have a couple of very nerdy film podcasts on Ooh. YouTube. But... <laughs> what are the names? I'm doing one called The Auteur Limits, where we're looking at the films of a very obscure American B-movie director called Sam Fuller at the moment. You know, if that happens to be, it's a very small crossover maybe between the podcast audience and people who are into the films of Sam Fuller. But, you know, if you are, check out The Auteur Limits. The whole, uh, the whole podcast is about this, it was about Sam Fuller. It's about one film by Sam Fuller each week. It's very <laughs> true. It's actually a stomachography. The Auteur Limits? The Auteur Limits, yeah. Okay, I'm going to listen It's very, to that. very niche. It's very niche. <laughs> but yeah, so probably for most of you, just uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. <laughs> Who knows? You might get another follower. I might get a follower. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time. 
And that's the end of the podcast right there. Hope you enjoyed the episode, but please don't go just yet. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people like you discover us and get the same insights, and it would really help us out a lot. Um, Thank you for being a loyal flying cat and for listening. See you next time. I saw it.